Thank you everyone for joining us. Very, very happy and honored. We have two amazing people who are experts in their fields and thought leaders to be joining us. Alexander, would you like to bring us into a coherence moment? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to welcome everybody. And we always take a moment before we dive into these first Fridays just to get ourselves clear and centered. I'm just gonna leave it up to you Whatever you need to do right now to get yourself clear and centered, whether it's breathing or closing your eyes or taking a moment or a pause, just take a, just take a minute or two and just get yourself centered. You may want to stand, you may want to stretch, whatever it is, but just a moment just to let go of what has been so far this day and to get ready for what's going to be a really... Um, fascinating 45 minutes with us here at Corenta. So just take a few moments to do that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Janice. So yeah, so my name is Janice Kaye. I'm the co-founder, president, chief catalyst at Corentis. We are very happy for our community members to have joined us today with our two thought leaders. So this community started years ago and we finally merged over to a new platform, um, which we're excited. It's much more you know, user-friendly, members could see members. And this is a community of people who are passionate about advancing team effectiveness. So we're all happy you are here. So today, for the next 45 minutes, we're going to do, Julie's going to take us through a sta our state of mind check-in. We're going to have a conversation with our two thought leaders. And if there's time at the end, Alexander will take us out with a mind mindfulness moment. My sincere pleasure to introduce Kevin Clark and Kyle Shannon um, to be our thought leaders for today. So Kevin is the founder of Content Evolution Federation, the first brand steward for the Think Bad Notebook Computers and Director Meritus brand and values experience for IBM. He owns several companies, serves on multiple boards, and he's also the co-host of a program called Content Evolution New World, tackling topics at the intersection, intersection of people and tech. It is also my pleasure and just my honor to also introduce Kyle Shannon, who has been a very good friend of mine for the past 30 plus years. That's Kyle not and I that's not true. It's all hearsay. We're not that old. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> we, go, we go way back. We go way back. <laughs> way back to the very uh, early 90s as Kyle and I were both in New York and leading new media companies. So Kyle ended up starting the first online advertising agency. You can't make that stuff up. <laughs> and of course, it was called agency.com. It was um, so early that that domain was just available. <laughs> just so early that, um, he's also currently um, the founder of AI Salon, AI Office Hours, and is the world's first chief generative officer, leading content of, uh, evolution collab for the development of AI digital twins and organizational AI. He's also the founder of Storyline, um, which is, you know, video with production right in your hands that automate ed editing in the cloud. So with that, it is with great pleasure I bring you Kyle and Kevin. It's an honor Thank to be here. Much. Really excited for the conversation. Yeah. And Janet, it, it, you know, given the time frame and New York, I, I was a, a founding member of the New York New Media Association uh, <laughs> when that's what we called this stuff, new media, right? And, yeah. you know, so we, we clearly date ourselves by going to those events and the Cyber Suds, right, uh, festivals, right, in Manhattan. So any event, all right? With that, yes, collective intelligence in the age of AI, all right? What we're going to talk about today is actually in Appendix A and Appendix B of the book, right? The rise of the agile individual and the rise or human and rise of the agile uh, organization. So we're going to talk about that, and I want to point out that 
writing a book is normally a very arduous journey, but writing with Kyle was really easy for two reasons. <laughs> We've been in discussion with each other on a variety of topics for over a decade, every week, and we have built our own digital twins. Content Evolution has you know, harnessed the technology to help us write articles together. We used both of our profiles to write this book together. And instead of a year, it took several months, right, of, uh, you know, collaborative effort and jumping in. I can tell you that my writer's block is gone because you can prompt your way to a start in seconds. Kyle, how do you feel about uh, our effort together? Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm obviously excited about it. You know, you and I have talked every week for, for 10 years. So, so we, we have some, some shorthand. Um, the, the idea for the book itself, um, for me, um, was triggered from <laughs> experiencing, um, large language models. I mean, primarily chat GPT initially. Um, but when I first started learning about these tools, the more I learned about them, the more remarkable they felt. Because when you look at how they actually do what they do, they embed data and turn it into this mathematical vector space. And it's just a cold probability calculator. Like it's just kind of a fancy version of a calculator. And yet what I consistently experienced was something that was much more human than that, much more felt empathetic than that much more nuanced than that and 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 i still have conversations with people that are like wow it's just predictive and it's just a and probably for about a year and a half i was i just had this this disconnect between how i understood it to work and what i actually experienced and i saw a tweet and this was i don't know six months or so ago maybe not even that long four months ago and it was just a simple tweet from this AI artist who said that artificial intelligence is the collective intelligence of humanity. It was that simple line. And what all of a sudden just struck me, it hit me right in the face, was, oh, the reason generative AI is so remarkable is not because of the mechanism. It's not because of the tool itself. It's because of the training data. And the training data is, you know, you know, Sam Waltman and the, the team at OpenAI, I think we're the first to really recognize that the more data that you threw at this thing and the more compute, the more brain power you threw at it, the better it got. And, and what they've effectively done is they've taken the, you know, collective output of humanity for the last, you know, 70 or 100 or 1000 years, and they've compressed it into this little softball that we get to play with now, where you input things, it does this cold probability calculation but it reflects us back to us. And so for me, and when I said that to Kevin, I said it, you know, I, I, I said that quote, it's the collective intelligence of humanity. He said, well, there's a bigger idea here, right? This is, it's not just the tool that we, we are in a moment where being connected, being in community, being in groups like this um, is, is every bit as important as using these tools that, that function in a very similar fashion, but, but for, you know, sort of historical data. So, um, so yeah, so I'm super excited to be talking about it and, and things like that. Yeah. And I'll just add that um, as we dive into the agile, you know, humans and the agile um, organizations is we've only let the technology read in the children's section of the library, right? Because there's a lot of adult literature that is sitting inside of a government skiff or behind a firewall of a large organization. The, the, the next level of, of information we have is either proprietary or you have, there's a paywall or there's something else that's preventing that coming into um, the training data world. And we're going to have to get better at that because if we want to harness the full capability of this, we're going to need to create data cooperatives to be able to start to do that. And maybe those are in small language models that are just for the use of the organization or for the government, but we're going to have to figure that out too. 
Content evolution, just a quick uh, understanding. Kyle is the world's first chief generative officer. No one else has that title. And he's had it for you know, a while now. And notice that we use the word generative, not AI there, because that's what's important, all right, is that it's, it's enabling, you know, generation of new content, new ideas, innovation. At the core, content evolution is about innovation, and you know, here in our you know Lotus chart, you know it unfolds into strategy, uh, and it, that's informed by research. And if you get the listening and the leading right in research and strategy, you have the the ability to express your intention as a brand in the marketplace. And then build that out as an experience and engagement with people. And if you do that well, you can go back and listen again, right? So the model is continuous in nature, although we get invited at various uh, moments to either do organization design and frameworks or do a branding exercise or do a customer experience uh, piece or do qualitative and quantitative research. Okay, so agile human. We're going to you know, talk about this, and this is what caught Janice's you know, eye in the first place. She read this on LinkedIn. We published an article, and we were saying that an agile human grasps the value of aptitude over learning skills in the age of AI, where every skill will be instantly available on demand. Uh, so two key words in here, the agile in the title, aptitude over skills, because guess what? You need a skill, it's gonna be available on demand, you're gonna be able to ask for it, uh, including now programming. And Kyle, I think you just saw that uh, based on uh, what, what our uh, friends uh, did, the, um, the uh, systems can prompt themselves. The computer can now uh, ask itself a question, correct? Yeah. So that makes companionship just that much more interesting. Yeah, yeah. And the the other thing about about these these aptitudes is um the gen the, the generative AI tools are getting so capable at doing the tactical execution that we have you seen those videos? I mean Let's look at the bright side of global warming, shall we? Um, have you seen those videos where icebergs completely flip upside down? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's about to happen with, with employment and work and how, how and why we engage people. So in our, in our current world, um, people with deep specialty skill sets um, tend to be valued higher than generalists, right? And we're about to enter a world where the generative AI is going to get really good at those tactical skills and, and the, the deep skills and the ability to look across disciplines um, and leverage these tools that can do lots of different things um, by their definition are going to start to you know, flip that value proposition where generalists are of you know, of higher value because they're going to be able to leverage these tools in ways. I My nickname for the era we're entering is revenge of the liberal arts major, um, that, that having a broad view is actually a superpower. And so a lot of what we're talking about with Agile Human is just that ability to be nimble and curious and, and to look across things and then be able to look at all of the different outputs and say, this is good, that's bad, you know, this is the thing I want to put in the world. And and that starts to become you know the the premier skill um, as as these tools get more and more capable. Absolutely, I, what what I uh, say to my friends in the university community is I said we need a specialization in generalization, right? We need to yeah. have <laughs> a degree in the zero hundred. If you have not explored at the library, I invite you to go to the zero hundreds. Okay, the zero 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 books. Right, dot something because that's the operating manual for the library about how you understand and classify human knowledge. Oh, interesting. If you haven't been there, it is the coolest place in the library, right? Huh. It, the books that you've never, you know, read. We think that, um, you know, that 
everything that we said about the agile you know individual relates also as you zoom out to the agile organization you know where we're empowering people we're looking at process innovation we're encouraging skunk works we're forming councils and that leads to the kind of you use the word coherence. I love the word coherence, right? Um, because you know the progression is actually misalignment, right? That we're not on the same page. Then there's alignment, which is somewhat like um, the language that you would use in diplomacy, which is we have shared interests, right? Coherence is where you have shared values, right? Where, you know, you are, you know, living in each other's space and there is a huge overlap, right? And the fact is that the Agile organization needs to be able to bring about coherence and do it in a way and embrace AI so that you can get the kind of end-to-end -end transformation that you'll get because you're going to be able to take the counsel of not only the people that are with you today, but build it up cumulatively because you'll be able to use AI to build institutional memory. Kyle? Yeah, and I, I, I think this idea of one of the things that I'm excited about in the book is, and, and one of the things we experience in Colab, so Colab is a, is a, a a think tank, a working group within content evolution, and we meet on a weekly basis. And the original intent was just to, you know, educate ourselves about the tools. And then we started to, you know, you sort of evolve when once you once you sort of figure out, okay, these tools can do this, they can do that, they can do the other. Then you start to very quickly get to, well, wait a minute, why are we doing this? What are we doing this for? What's the purpose? And 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 that led us to the discovery of this idea of, of wanting to create digital twins for all of the members of the organization. And that, that initial conversation um, was, well, let's go scrape LinkedIn. We'll get our LinkedIn profile data. We'll use that as a knowledge source for a GPT. And then that'll kind of represent who we are. And as we were talking and trying to figure out, well, why would we use these digital twins? What do we want to use them for? What we got to was, well, wouldn't it be amazing if I could have a virtual interaction with Kevin and get his input on something 24-7? And, and what struck us was that if you're just looking at LinkedIn data, that's just sort of a small fragment of who someone is. It's historical looking. It's just kind of based on their, their employment. And it's an archaeological dig. Yeah, it's an archaeological a current dig. view. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an archaeological dig onto who they were. So, mm -hmm. so we could create a digital twin of someone that used to be right, and some fragment of them. So then we ended up designing uh, this this structured interview that was who are you today? And so whenever we create one of these digital twins, we have a video recording session where we walk someone through this digital interview. What we learned is if they type their answers. The digital twin is horrible because how we type is not how we talk. And so we do these interviews with people. And, and in doing that, in, in doing that collaboration, you get to know them better. Like our relationships within content evolution have deepened just because of that process. And so what we're finding is that there's this collective intelligence that we're tapping into with AI, but then there's also this collective intelligence of this group trying to figure out what are these these tools? What do they make possible? How are we going to leverage them? And that symbiosis, for lack of a better term, is just this remarkably um, dynamic experience with the people within within Colab um, that that is is quite remarkable. And I, and so migrating that to an organization, um, I, I think is the only way forward because it is impossible for any of us to understand what the implications of these tools are because they're so profound they're they're pro so pro profoundly powerful and about to get more and more powerful as as we bring autonomous agents on um and they're starting to show up and i think in the next 6 months we're going to see um these tools be able to do our jobs and then in in that case if the tools can do our jobs what are our jobs we don't know and the only way we're going to get to that is to be you know, in, in this place of inquiry and collaboration. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about asking better questions, and we think that asking better questions is a core skill set now, right? And you know that you need to be able to do that. I'm going to point out that we did an experiment with a podcaster, Emily Shaw, right, who has this thing called Candy Ears, right? So she took our digital twins and asked them questions and created a voice mimic of, of us. Now, you just heard, you know, you've heard me speak and you've heard Kyle speak. Uh, my wife said, oh, that sounds just like you, Kevin. Uh, the When we got uh, Kyle's up, he said, yeah, the response was just like you, but it sounded like, you know, you were on Ritalin, okay, that, you know, because Kyle is so animated, he is so <laughs> vibrant, okay, that the digital, you know, voice could not be animated enough to capture Kyle, all right, so that's just, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, being in you, my friend, I'll tell you, there, there's a, there's a funny corollary to that story is, um, so when I put the digital twins out there, I, I also, because, because I make good life choices, I have a TikTok channel, um, I'm, a, I'm a TikTok host of this thing called the AI Learning Lab. And so every night, five nights a week, I go live and talk about generative AI and what the implications are. And But I do it in this really fun way. And I cuss and I it's just kind of it's, it's as much entertainment as, as it is education. And so when I put out the digital twin that we created for Content Evolution, which is this professional, you know, this is the professional version of me, the 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 regulars that show up to my TikTok channel, they've nicknamed themselves the irregulars. Um, I got comments from them, you know, saying things like, well, it doesn't, you know, your, your digital twin doesn't swear and it, it doesn't know embrace the jank and it doesn't know you can make money with chat GPT, all these catchphrases that I say. And what struck me in that is that I, I think a skill we're all going to have to develop moving forward is what does digital twin mean? What are the what are the ways I might want to represent myself, you know, in the world? There might be the fun me, the social me, the professional me. So just like you you context shift in life depending on who you're talking to, um, I think we're going to have digital representations of that. And really thinking about how am I represented in the world is something we're going to have to confront because either we're going to do it proactively or it's going to be done for us. <laughs> so hundred percent. So on this uh, chart, let me just clear this quickly that we think that, you know, the intersection of the agile human organization, the strategies is you have to have a learning culture. You have to be constantly in, you know, we are thirsty to learn and listen and observe and expound the boundaries of, you know, what we're doing so that we fully understand the fitness landscape around us. Cross-functional teams uh, were, were both big believers in diversity, uh, that diverse friction is a good thing. We need to challenge our business models. Uh, we need to get rid of unjustified assumptions that are at the foundation of what might have been a good idea when we were doing this 10 years, 20 years two years ago, right? But things are changing too fast. Ch challenge those unjustified assumptions. Invest in aptitude. The T-type personality is increasingly going to be a very wide top stroke and perhaps you know less deep downstroke because every downstroke that you need, you can bring into existence with you know a prompt. And when we look at this, you know, you want a rapid prototype and discard ideas as rapidly as you find the ones that you want to embrace on a leadership basis, we want you to be a mentor. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the work that Mintzberg does, right? And, you know, the fact is, you know, he talks about, you know, wanting to create fertility or allowing people to do their jobs, right? To you know, act out on their roles as opposed to telling people what to do. We need reverse mentoring. We need uh, young people who are going to be more you know effective at this, uh, coaching the people who are leading the organizations today, and they need to go ahead and get on with that right now. And empowerment, right, is giving people the ability to do things at earlier stages in, in their career. 
So I had a conversation with Janice earlier today, and we said, whoa, what, what's going to be next? Well, what's next is in between the individual human and the organization is what you specialize in, in your organization, teams, the rise of the agile team. And Janice and Kyle and Kevin are going to write about this, right? <laughs> so we should, you know, listen to you as we go into Q&A today. Uh, but Kyle has been a great team leader. You know, the CoLab is a subsection of Content Evolution, and he has harnessed so the remarkable nature of what we've been able to do. And now we have, out of our, you know, 30 members, we have almost all of them modeled, right, as GPTs, and we're writing together, and we're publishing together, and it's just a new level of energy for us. So, Janice, we're looking forward to writing with you. Kyle, um, wow, it's fun collaborating. Yeah, so. it's, it's it's crazy times. I, the, I, I think the final thing before you jump into Q and A, and I'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts, Janice, is just you know my strong, strong, strong plea to all of you is that if you are not aggressively curious about AI right now, that you should be. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't say more than that, but the tools, particularly in the past three months, are getting so good across the board from all companies. That that like literally throwing a a dartboard at generative AI is going to be some tool that's going to be valuable for you, and it's accelerating away from us. It's accelerate like I I focus on this every single night and have been doing it for two and a half or three years, and I can feel it pulling away from me. So if you're not actively in it, my, you know I I know that's sort of an end of the conversation thing, but I I just things are moving right now and especially for for you know knowledge work um there's, there's kyle some does the nations coming i mean kyle is doing the deep dive and that's why he's such a good partner and i'm more of the zoom you know dolly up and out because i'm looking at what are the policy implications what does this mean from the standpoint of what kind of regulatory framework should we have you know there's a po paper that's coming out on ai and democracy for the uh, you know Institute for the uh, uh, Service uh, Innovation Professionals right before the end of the year, and ISIP, you know, is clearly interested in so how do we make this world safe right for using this so that we continue to have diverse ideas coming around as opposed to you know these becoming you know, monolithic data sources. There are implications, by the way, for where the data training sets are. And, you know, if you look at um, some of our, um, you know, competitors at a geo, you know, level, their billion dollar data training sets of, you know, populations that have no privacy rights, right? That will make a great data training set for, for AI. The question is, will you want to use it? Because it will have a different value system, right, embedded in it. And so with that, I'm looking forward to uh, questions. I know Kyle is too. And um, so far, so good. Now let's have some fun with your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin and Kyle. That was um, extremely informative. What I hope you all glean from this is you are working with leaders, teams, and organizations on and you can bring forward, it's not AI tools, but those that list of helping them understand the importance of curiosity, helping them understand the importance of being agile. If they're stuck in their thinking, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to run organizations in the very near future. So to really help these leaders, you know, open up and embrace not, not just AI, but embrace change to start, just embracing change to start with. Being curious, being in teams, leaning in. Not everyone has to be an expert, as they were saying, but the team in and of itself has to, be, has to work together and they can rely on one another to have these differing perspectives. Not By the way, if you build a digital twin, you can take your own counsel. You can have a conversation with yourself privately and say, well, this is the question that I'd really like to ask the team, but I'm not sure yet. Well, you can do that 
right? And it's actually very useful. Yeah, the the other thing I'd like to um, amplify that you just said, Janice, is that you don't have to be the expert. I'll take it a point further. One of the things I talk about nightly on my on, at the AI Learning Lab is there are no experts right now. Mm -hmm. This is very similar to the early days of the World Wide Web, Janice, where you, you know what made the New York New Media Association and the World Wide Web Artist Consortium a thing is that everyone was trying to figure it out, right? Everyone, you know, that you couldn't go to school for it, right? You couldn't go to school for web design or for UX design. We're at a very similar place with AI. And I would look at November 30th, 2022, the launch of ChatGPT as, as, a, as a new era, right? A, a different um, uh, realm of AI where um, it's democratized the power of AI to the rest of us, right? Which the World Wide Web did that for the internet back in the 90s. That's what's happening here. And so while you will have experts on artificial intelligence and machine learning and math and weights and vectors and that sort of thing, how you use these generative AI tools, there are no experts because the technology is literally changing on a weekly basis. So the person that put together the educational workshop that you took three months ago, all of that stuff is out of date today. And so really embracing being the not expert <laughs> And 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 inviting change, not just saying, you know, I'm willing to to embrace change, but inviting change by, you know, playing with these tools and being a non-expert and just seeing what emerges. That to me is the skill right now. Which brings the importance of collaborative teams mm -hmm. much more in the forefront. So with that, I open it up to our professionals who are passionate about effective teaming. Who has a question for Kyle or Kevin? Lots of information in the chat. You can pick something oh, from sorry. there. Yeah, there's there's one um, from, from Julie um, Lawton's. I'd love to hear how non-experts will de develop discernment to know if AI answers are sound. It's a, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll take this one and please jump in. Um, when I talk about, you know, sort of horizontal expertise and, and discern, discernment, if someone has deep skills in, in a in a in a vertical, right? If they've got deep skills in that, they are going to be able to look at the output of AI and and kind of immediately know, oh, this is good, that's bad. So I think there's a short-term advantage for um, for deep expertise. And I think this goes back to Kevin's, you know, T-shaped human, where you may have deep expertise somewhere. But but just staying in that lane is is going to start to to be a disadvantage. Like look, being able to look across things is important. I'll share one example of of something. Um, a guy that I used to work with at agency.com named PJ Locker, and he's he started a new agency, and it's an AI agency. And he ended up firing his copywriter and and making his account person the copywriter. And 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 so when he said it, it was kind of, you know, shocking. And people were like, well, wait, tell us more about that. Like, wh why did you choose the account person? And like, did the account person want to be the copywriter? And she didn't. She was terrified of it. And he said, th this was so telling to me. He said, the reason that he fired the copywriter, it, it wasn't a personality thing. He said, the account person had taste. And taste was everything because the account person could could have the AI generate the copy. And because she had taste, she was able to look at that and go, ah, OK, I know what the client needs. So she was initially very reticent, like I'm not a copywriter. I don't do that sort of thing. But she knew what the clients needed. And so what PJ said is he would have had it had the roles been reversed, had the copywriter had that taste, that sort of innate taste, he would have kept her, right? So it, it wasn't a skills thing. It was an aptitude thing. And it was just, she had the innate discernment that he said, I'm going to assume that the technology will allow her to write copy. But what I can't recreate is that taste, that discernment. So I think part of it is some people will naturally have that. And then I think some people will need to develop that. Hey, Kyle, uh, just to add to that briefly, I was at a, uh, a briefing at, at Ogilvy looking at 
you know, the key attributes that were associated with ThinkPad. And they said, oh, guess what? We're going to give you a brand steward, right? Uh, so that, you know, we can manage, you know, how people feel and, you know, uh, react to this. And the VP who was in the room said, wait a minute, all right? And he you know, was a long pause and he says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna outsource our values to you. Kevin will be the brand steward, mm. right? I got a promotion, right? Like in 30 seconds, but he had to think about it. He said, I'm not giving this to Ogilvy, right? Yep. Yep. It's too important. And, you know, more recently I've said, the brand should not be managed by the CMO. It belongs in the CEO's office because it's too important an asset you know, to simply be managed as a metrics and you know evaluation right piece. Because at the end of the day, this is what's going to cause people to come back and continue to do business with you. All right. So um, just a quick add to that, Kevin, just to underscore yeah. that mm -hmm. is we're finding more and more the organizations that are really leaning into AI are the ones who are becoming more human. Yes. Because they're realizing the value. Yes. Their competitive advantage is not just that value list that they made up years ago that's on some shelf. They're bringing it out, they're dusting it off, and they're saying, we exactly. need to be more authentically human. Yeah. In, in fact, when I delivered this keynote at the uh, Frontiers and Service Conference this summer, um, because I was interviewed for this paper about the caring machine, all right? And it was talking about how does empathy eventually enter into this frame? Uh, you know, the fact is it's a simulation, right? It's not authentic human empathy that you're experiencing. However, it's a really good representation. And to the degree that you can model the value system of the company as the interaction layer, with the things that you're doing. And that becomes the guidance to the people who are actually on the phone, who are actually responding, who are developing the next product, right? To the degree that that's modeled for you using this technology, that is a really good use of it. Well, and yeah, like one of the things that I notice about ChatGPT that it took me a long time to figure out why does it feel so good? And it's what what hit me is collaborating with ChatGPT is kind of like collaborating with a golden retriever, <laughs> personality wise. Like it's it, like you're like, hey, here's a crappy idea, and ChatGPT is like, awesome idea, boss. You know, give me some more. You want to do some more together? Like it's just it's always there and it's always positive. And I found it, I found myself modeling how it behaved and kind of reflecting like when you deal with people. Like, even if they're well-meaning, like you, you know, you, you share an idea in a meeting and someone goes, eh, that little eh may shut me down for a week, mm. right? ChatGPT never does that. It's just always there like, gee, shucks, boss, let's go. Like, I feel like I'm in a 50s movie, you know, with like, let's, let's get the bikes and go down to the candy store. You know, so. We've got a whole bunch of questions popping up in the chat. We've just got a couple of minutes. Can we just go through those quickly? Is that realistic? We'll do the lightning round. We'll, we'll respond fast. Lightning questions, yeah. How Go can we it. leverage AI to foster equity? Uh, you need to write prompts and engage with it, asking for the most diverse right, uh, sources and the, you know, giving you multiple voices, right, when you're asking your questions, right? Um, and if you get something that is uh, feels monolithic, ask again, right? Okay. And say, give me more sources, give me a broader perspective, make this uh, in a perspective and, you know, give it to me from 10 different countries point of view, right? Okay. So that's it's what like, I'm hearing, Kevin, as you say that is that's us engaging one-to-one -one with the yep. AI platform. Is there a use for AI, a use case for AI that's more outward from the AI? Or is it really, are we in this realm of it's it's the, the, the thing we're talking to day by day, that's the realm we're really talking about? Well, I think, I think it is up to, it's ultimately up to us to choose what is the thing we get from the AI that we want to put in the world? Got it. And how do we want to interact with it? So I, I almost feel like this, the extent to which you use AI 
is essentially no one's business, <laughs> right? You interact with this tool, you interact with other people, you come up with some work product and you put that in the world and you put your name on it. That feel that doesn't change. Yeah. Now, how you got there might change radically and like what you choose to to pull out of this thing. And you might be able to get way more diverse perspectives if you prompt it to do that. And then you can choose of that what to put in the world. Got yeah. it. That so makes sense. Front end is the diverse data training sets, as diverse as you can get. And then you need to be able to ask questions that have the equity, diversity and inclusiveness. All right. Which. I, I don't, uh, you know, go DEI, all right, I use IDEA, all right, as I jumble the letters around, all right, because I think that, you know, DEI also creates the word IDEA, all right, um, very nicely. Go ahead, next. Okay, so there's one here on, please comment on techno accelerationist manifestos from folks like Mark Anderson. Remember, follow the money, follow the power of the movers and shakers. But uh, I, I, I try not to get into what, what I'm trying not to do right now is, is judge, um, judge what's happening. What I'm trying to live with is this stuff is here, whether we like it or not. And it's, it's accelerating, whether we like it or not. What I'm trying to do is just say, given that, how can I interact with it? How can I use it to the to the best of my ability? And, and it's my belief that the more people that interact with these tools in an, in an intentional way and bend it even slightly toward the light will have a dramatic impact over time. And so if, if, if you're concerned about these tools not being used well, use them well, mm -hmm. right? And that will make a difference. So I mean, I'm I, going to interrupt if that's okay. Kyle and Kevin, can you stay on for a couple more minutes and answer yeah, some yeah. questions? Would that be okay? 100%. And so just so we can stay on time, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank our thought leaders. And I want to really encourage you to go out there and either you're coaching or consulting or advising or facilitating. The key is the more human we are, the more authentically human we are the world will be a better place. So yep. that's what I'm encouraging. So for those who want to stay and ask Kevin and Kyle other questions, yep. can you be like we, for another 10 minutes? Is that okay? Can I'm, I'm going to the top of the hour. Yeah. And we say that we, you know, we kind of end, you know, our book, our, our book is right here, right? <laughs> that, um, uh, that we think this technology, that AI can help us become more human, right? Because if it authentically embodies the things and we can get more focused more quickly on what we're doing, it allows us to move from information to knowledge to judgment or wisdom, right? Faster and spend more time at that point, okay? Because if you're spending all your time gathering the information and then trying to synthesize it, you don't have enough time to add the value that's really making it fully human all right, and making a good decision. So we think that this is a, an enabling moment and that it will cause us to be able to use our attention in a much more powerful way. Yeah. I'll, and I'll put it in, I'll, I'll, I'll expand on it in a different way. Um, or, or just a, a yeah different way. Um, for me, in any given day, I have some fixed amount of creative hours of of energy. Right. Some days it's one hour. Some days it's three hours. Some days it's eight hours. Right. It's just that. But that creative energy, right, where you're we're actually creating in the world, and that's the that amount of energy I have for for that um, modality is fixed. And no matter where I put my creative energy, it gets spent. So if I put my creative energy on like organizing things or typing things into a spreadsheet, then it's gone. So if I'm doing sort of low level tactical work or blocking and tackling writing, then if I spend my three hours of creative energy, then it's gone on that lower level stuff. What I'm finding with AI is that it very, very quickly gets ideas out of my head and manifested that used to take me most of that two or three hours. And now I have it in five minutes. And so I can spend that two or three hours 
refining and sort of living at this higher creative level for longer. And that is like stunning and remarkable and energizing. Wow. Question. So with that, I want to um, just uh, give Chris the floor and then Tosca if you wanted to go. But Chris first. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle, for addressing my question. You've answered it beautifully. I yeah. agree. This is not about disengaging. This is about oh. us engaging with why eyes wide open for the social, political, cultural, and planetary implications. Yep. So I agree, in fact, that if I can save precious brain power using this, I not only can do my practice better, I can address the seven generational ecological issues. Yeah. Precisely because you're right. This yes. is not Luddism when I raise these questions and you answered it beautifully. Thank, thank you. you. Thank and you. Thank you for uh, mentioning seventh generation wisdom. That's a important concept. Anybody else? Tosca, did you want to, do you have a question? Not, but not you... really. It was more uh, a comment, uh, uh, but it was it was answered also. I find right now the the feedback one gets as a very basic user is so canned and it's so American um, shaped. But the diversity of data sets is, has already been mentioned. So no, no question. I I'm going to tell you that it. we've done some work inside of our Choice Flows business unit where we've asked the same question, but said answer it as if you're in this part of the world, in this part of the world, in this part of the world, all right? And I was originally using that to create names for branding, but now I'm using it for market intelligence, all right? And it's interesting because I can peer inside the C-suite and get those sentiments in different parts of the world. Um, and frankly, it works better with the Google tool because it's reflecting the questions that C-suite people have asked in the past. So uh -huh. it has a record and the data training set is helping me do the excavation. If you're interested in that, let me know. I'll also say that um, I used to sit at the kitchen table and look at my dad who ran executive resources for IBM, you know, putting you know people in different senior you know positions. And you know, I asked kind of a naive question. I said, so what is the, you know, what makes one of these folks better qualified than somebody else? And on the back of a napkin, it was pretty easy. Competence and character, right, is do they know what they're doing? Do we trust them based on their competence? And then the ineffable quality that comes up in the upper right-hand quadrant is judgment, right? Is do I think this person has good judgment? And we want to put people in jobs that have good judgment. In the age of AI, competence becomes available on demand, right? You can get a lot of the things that you need. So what you can double down on in your stuff is character, is building character, right? Because judgment, right, is still the quality that you want, but you want people that have access to a lot of different skills have great character that you've been building, and that allows that judgment to manifest. Um, I see um, a question from Julie, is, is the Google tool your preferred tool? Um, I would not, so a couple of things. I would I, not pay any annual subscriptions right now. <laughs> I would only do month to month. Um, I would try, I would experiment in the AI salon. We have a journey to AI literacy and it's, it's three stages. Stage one is play first. Stage two is mindfully create. Stage three is generously lead. So generously lead means learn out loud, share what you're learning. But the play first is really important. These tools right now are, they're very, very different. They have very, very different personalities. There's some things where I really like Google. I think Notebook LM is remarkable because you're only interacting with the data that you upload to it. So if you want something to reflect how you think, fill it full of data of how you think, and then you will have an LLM that does that. Um, but, but you know, talking with uh, advanced voice in ChatGPT is completely different than interacting with Claude, where you're getting it to create an interactive dashboard is completely different than perplexity, which feels like a research project. Like I would say, play with as many as you can. 
almost like you're feeling in the dark and figure out where the edges are and where the boundaries are. And, and you will start to understand the personalities of these tools. And, and I mean that like personalities, like a coworker, like some of them are going to be very rigid and predictable. And some of them are going to be like crazy zany and there's a place for all of them, but you have to play to discover where those are for you. They all had different data training sets. Yep. They all had different reasons for coming into existence. And therefore, their, you know, their, their behavior, their responses to what you're doing is different. When we, you know, ask ourselves, you know, I, th this is the interview that we give people, all right? And our stuff is built on OpenAI's, you know, GPT-4, right? Um, and Kyle's responses sound like Kyle. Um, the, it has you know, access to the things that he has asked questions about. So it, it continues to get trained, you know, over over time. The only reason I invoked Google was there, that was a market intelligence response, all right? Um, so that was the context for that reference. And I think that Anthropic is doing remarkable work. OpenAI is doing remarkable work, all right? So, you know. Well, let me, let me throw in another thing. You should also go way outside of your comfort zone. If you're great with words, go to Suno or Udio and write a song or go to Midjourney and make images or go make videos, yeah. text to video. Do things significantly beyond your expertise because what you'll find is it will do something that you'll you'll be like, oh my God, I've always wanted to be an artist. That was this, this latent thing that Seriously, I, I I experience this every day within the salon that I'm finding people reinventing themselves in their business because they they now can do something they never thought possible. So so be willing to be a non expert way outside of your comfort zone, and I, you will find remarkable power there. Absolutely. On that note, my dear friends, all of my dear friends, thank you so much for coming. We'll see you next first Friday and I'll see you all in the community.